So as an archaeological illustrator, my concern is always to make archaeology more understandable. Uh, my work has taken me from Neolithic Chattel Hirk to pirate coves in the Caribbean to my current work on survey and excavation projects in the islands of Palau and Yap in Micronesia in the Western Pacific. But as a resident of North Wales, I also work on projects much closer to home for CADU, for the Kluid Powys Archaeological Trust, and for community organizations in the market town of Oswestry, about 60 miles south of here. At first glance, there seems little to connect these two working environments. They are, quite literally, half a world apart. Archaeologically, geographically, culturally, climatologically, there doesn't at first appear anything that is shared between the islands of Palau and the hills of Wales. But recently, I have become aware that there are connections between these two places, that they do share similarities in the context for public heritage work. And these similarities mean that there are similar issues to be considered and addressed when it comes to telling stories about the past. This awareness has evolved out of a very particular kind of archaeological illustration I have been doing over the past 10 years, informational comics used to communicate the process, practice, data, interpretation, and broader context of archaeological work. And these are, in fact, from Anglesey. Uh, these comics are informational works which are designed to communicate the complex and specialist work done in archaeology, anthropology, history, and heritage. What I've discovered is that their unique way of presenting information allows me to talk about what we do, how we do it, why we do it, and who does it in an engaging and accessible way to a wide range of audiences. With, as a result, what began as a minor sideline to, to more traditional forms of drawing and visualization has become my main focus as an archaeological illustrator. And I now produce comics from everything from excavation and survey to archaeological law. And this is from a comic about repatriation in the United States. Not only do comics change the way information about archaeology is presented, importantly, they change the way that information can then be used and understood by its audiences. Comics are a distinctive mechanism, a uh, distinctive medium, uh, with a distinctive central mechanism, a close and interdependent relationship between image and text used to build a sequential narrative. By combining image and text, comics do three important things with information about archaeology. First, a comic can visualize the context of abstract or unfamiliar content. You don't know what our trench at Grand Bay looks like? No problem, I'll show you. You don't know how to use an auger? No problem, I'll show you. You don't know how a carbon-14 dating sample is prepared? No problem, I'll show you. The old saying of a picture being worth a thousand words is never more true in than in informational comics, and perhaps never more true than in archaeological comics where images can be used to contextualize and help explain new terminology and ideas. Second, a comic is able to manage complexity by breaking down dense informational content into discrete elements, panels, sequences of linked pictures, captions, speech bubbles, and so on. The very things that make a comic a comic become building blocks that can be organized and paced to suit the requirements of a particular audience. The comic then becomes an invitation to that audience to reassemble information so that it makes sense to them. Reading a comic then becomes a participatory, constructive engagement with content. Thirdly, comics can humanize and ground specialist narratives by using real-world narratives to front explanations and by showing real-world events, locations, and things. A comic can, quite literally, put a face to our practice. Real archaeologists can narrate their real work in the real locations that work takes place. And perhaps most importantly, this can also bring the communities that host archaeological work, again, literally into the picture. By doing so, a comic is able to materialize the otherwise invisible networks of community support and, con and consent which make our research possible in the first place. These three threads, contextualization, managing complexity, and grounding, are woven through all of my comics work. Contextualization allows me to address, without being confrontational, an audience's lack of prior knowledge. Decomplicating allows me to present real and often in-depth information about sites, concepts, and processes in a way which isn't dumbed down, while using real people as narrators allows me to ground that information with an intuitive and human sense of scale. Even in the shortest four-panel newspaper comic strip, the medium allows me to present information about the archaeological or historical past very much within a framework of contemporary heritage work and meaning. These comics are not just a presentation of what is known about the past, but how that knowledge was created, 
by whom and for whom. In both the uh, post-colonial Pacific Islands and post-industrial Wales, the idea of connecting people and place, of connecting past and present, is significant because in both places, shifting populations, shifting languages, and shifting cultural identities have, over the past 60 years, disrupted traditional heritage narratives and changed the dynamics between people and place. In both places, past and present must be reconnected, and the specific mechanics of comics, providing context, managing complexity, grounding and humanizing, can help build such new connections. Between the summer of 2016 and the spring of 2018, I produced two series of weekly comic strips about the history, archaeology, and heritage of the market town of Oswestry, uh, as I say, 60 miles south of here on the North Wales border. These four panel strips were published every Tuesday in the Oswestry and Border Advertiser, uh, the local rag, as it were, um, and also on social media, and were envisaged as a way to tell the diverse story of Oswestry's past in an engaging and accessible way. The comics began as something, broadly speaking, educational, a means by which the long and complex history of Oswestry could be broken down into bite-sized chunks for easy consumption by a non-specialist audience. But as people got to know the series, they began to come forward with history and archaeology stories of their own. For example, Simon Jarman, an ex-army chef who has done extensive research on Oswestry resident Alexis Sawyer, whose 19th century invention of a stove saved hundreds, if not thousands, of British soldiers from dysentery and malnutrition in the Crimean War, and, the stove, and whose stove was still being used by the British Army right up until the Gulf War. In fact, the uh, building in which the Army Catering Corps uh, is housed in is called Sawyer House. Or the carved stonework that Mark and Rachel unearthed in their back garden while building a rockery, stonework that may have come from the fantastic Methodist chapel just down the road, torn down in 1967, ground into hardcore, and used to fill in the car park at the back of the market. Or the research done by Barbara Molesworth and Lawrence Mortimer on the long lost and recently rediscovered botanical journals of the Reverend William Walsh and Howe, uh, which document a century's worth of environmental and climate change in the fields between Oswestry and Whittington. There are many more such examples, local, archae local archaeology and history, not just emerging through, but embedded in other everyday things, rambling and horse riding, literature and hymn writing, apiculture and gardening. Perhaps because of the way we departmentalize projects in the United Kingdom, things tend to be compartmentalized as a result. Archaeology and environmental studies, for example, draw from separate areas of expertise, access different kinds of funding, and conceptualize and target outreach in different ways. On the islands I work on in the Pacific, however, there is a high degree of connectedness. Environmental studies, traditional culture, history and archaeology are considered to all be part of a broader whole. The president of Palau asks, explicitly asks visitors to the island to appreciate the connection between our people, our culture, and our environment as part of an outreach surrounding the pledge that each visitor must sign when arriving in the island nation. And if you don't sign it, they don't let you in. Uh, this understanding of connectedness is something I also recognize from working with community heritage groups in Wales and along the Welsh borderlands. Heather and Hillforts, Mears and Mosses, Old Oswestry Hillfort Watch, the Office Dyke Collaboratory, these initiatives express formally a common understanding at the community level that archeological and historical heritage go hand in hand with, amongst many other things, environmental and green heritage. And so, the Oswestry Heritage Comics included stories about the green corridor and community orchard, the growing of heritage apple varieties, no less, that are all part of the Cambrian Heritage Railway. Stories about the fact that old Oswestry Iron Age Hillforth hosts all three species of protected newt, is home to the globally threatened common linnet, and is an ecological niche for dozens of native plants and herbs. Such stories are seen by those with an interest in local heritage as both important and part and parcel of the same thing. As a result, I would often talk to several different kinds of community heritage groups in preparing a single story, church historians and heritage botanists, preservation railway enthusiasts and lepidopterists, archaeologists and medical historians, walkers and lorry spotters. At a professional level, no, seriously. <laughs> At a professional level, however, it is often considered disruptive to deviate too far from the main archaeological story in including, for example, elements of an environmental story. Such threads may be regarded as equal, but are usually treated as separate. With the Oswestry Heritage Comics, however, such divergence was never disruptive. Rather than components to separate but equal stories, 
I was able to treat ecological heritage and archaeological heritage in the same way as the community, as complementary components to the same story. This year on Palau and Yap, I'm working with the Bureau of Arts and Culture and the Historic Preservation Office on comics, on comics commissions which explicitly bring together intangible heritage skills, military archaeology, planning policy guidance, and environmental stewardship. These will be outreach comics in which connections and associations understood within the community are being realized uh, at the professional level by commissioning agencies. The resulting public heritage narrative will contain a diversity of informational stories. In both the North Wales borderlands and the islands of the Pacific, there are conflicting priorities and perceptions with regard to language, ethnicity, antecedents, and privilege. Coming to terms with a post-colonial legacy in the Pacific, with a post-industrial legacy in Wales, has left community histories fragmented and community relationships with those histories divided. National versus local, professional versus community, us versus them. But in both the Pacific and Wales, I see the unique potential of comics to bring together and reconcile variant heritage stories as a way to negotiate some of these fault lines. The success of the Oswestry Heritage Comics was largely due to the fact that their focus was Oswestry. Yes, they talked about Oswestry's connections to wider historical themes and events, but always from the perspective of Oswestry. And while the archaeological story about the search for the earliest human settlement in the Pacific has obvious implications for Micronesia as a whole, the comic <coughs> frames that story through questions asked by the local community. What does this mean for Yap? What does this mean for Palau? What does this mean for us? This shift of focus is not about using a local story to displace a national or supranational one. It is about bringing two halves of the story together in a meaningful way. Comics can tell a public heritage story that leads its audience to find the national, the international, and the global within the local. Indeed, comics can tell a public heritage story that leads its audiences to first find the local in the personal, making visible a broad range of individual experiences of the past, volunteering, research, tourism, reenactment, which are then explicitly connected to higher level historical, archeological, or heritage narratives. Visualizing such scalar relationships then helps redefine the local value of sites and monuments. Such a process can help find a place for local stewardship and expertise within larger frames of responsibility and present local heritage engagement within larger, larger contexts. There is no question but that a great many people are already involved in local heritage. But as well as being different, professional and community-based heritage activities are often presented quite differently and quite separately. Comics can break down some of those barriers by using vernacular and local uh, places in which to talk about heritage. Outreach is then extended beyond specialist and professional spaces, beyond museums and academic journals. The Oswestry Heritage Comics were published in, weekly in the local newspaper, and our comic on Yap is being given away in hotels and pool halls. Comics as walking trails, comics as coloring pages, all of these things extend heritage discourse into alternative spaces. And by telling a story that crosses the whole spectrum of heritage knowledge, comics then identify who is talking about the past and from what point of view, countering perceptions that local history is curated and managed remotely by distant and unaccountable agencies with little connection to the community. The comics that I've done in Yap, Palau, and Oswestry demonstrate how different stories told by different people with different backgrounds can be uh, it, different interests and different agendas can be brought together and a whole woven together from variant strands. If each of these stories is allowed to become segregated, however, hedged by us and them differences, the landscape of local heritage <coughs> can quickly fragment along ethnic, linguistic, political, and cultural lines. But I'm beginning to understand that weaving together different stories of heritage can evolve into something more than simply a way to fill in the gaps. It starts to come, become part of a process of reconciliation, where communities are remade in the aftermath of historical trauma. In the Pacific, the bringing together of different versions of history, that of colonizer and colonized, of aggressor and victim, is an important part of the way that Palauans, Japanese, Americans, and Germans manage the ongoing process of post-war, post-colonial reconciliation between us and them. As part of this process, my archeological comics are traveling next year to the Setagaya Museum in Tokyo as part of an exhibition to mark a 25-year milestone in the cultural reconciliation between Palau and Japan, colonizer and colonized, victim and aggressor. Comics as public outreach can tell a pluralistic and inclusive story of heritage. As an explicit counter to the divisiveness of sectarian us versus them histories, 
that appropriate a narrow and selective interpretation of heritage. In his seminal work, When Was Wales?, the Welsh historian and writer Gwynalf Williams repeatedly emphasized how central the sense of history was to the generational process of remaking Welsh identity. Perhaps, then, an articulation of that sense of history, the storytelling of history, that is connected, personal, and local, can be considered part of the toolkit necessary to both understand and mitigate the generational impact of post-industrial us-versus-them identities, urban versus rural, incomer versus local, Welsh versus English. From Babeldob to Brincathley Thee, from the Pacific to North Wales, making public heritage relevant and meaningful is about making clear and explicit connections between archaeological and historical landscapes and the complex and diverse communities which live within them. Babeldob and Brincathley Thee share post-colonial and post-industrial histories of division, fragmentation, and disempowerment. But through comics, I have found that it is possible to create narratives of local heritage which are clear, accessible, and engaging, as well as complex, diverse, and inclusive, ones that can be used to constructively align both professional and government agencies with community-based working, prioritizing and enabling local concerns and curiosities, and empowering a community's interest in its own past in order to make public heritage management, research, and investigation more relevant. Thank you.